and got Gabri- and Gabrizel joining in with some singing. <laughs> yeah, Dream Girl. Oh, such a good movie. One of the best. That sounds a good movie. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, really good soundtrack. <clears throat> okay, so we um. <clears throat> Wow, so, you know, this, I was going to bring, you know, okay, because I was thinking about the name, you know, this all sort of started out because of the idea of just books that really teach us about stuff, and so um, I was reading a biography of W.E.B. Du Bois, which was just amazing, and, like, now I'm, because I knew who he was, but he was just such a major, major figure in the, um, <clears throat> he was born, he died, he, he was born, like, around the 1870, in the 1870s, because he died in the early 60s at age 95. He died right before the March on, right before the March on Washington. Mm. Yeah, which he influenced so many people, but what was, so inter- interesting is um, just some of the mechanisms and ideas that started out this, with the civil rights movement, and one of the because Du Bois trained as he was a political scientist and an and, and anthropologist, and so what he was doing so far the beginning of his civil rights work was just researching talking to talking to people and trying to just kind of even figure out what was going on with black people during his era and so it was it was like everything was too complicated even to try and start going, start doing, working for civil rights because there just wasn't enough information about people's lives. So what he did, I mean, it's just, it's interesting to me because gathering information can just be such a, such a political act. And so he was just needing to find out about how about how people were living and what their and what their issues are and try and get you know in that in order to advocate for civil rights and human rights you had to know what was going on and so there was just a whole lot of people who weren't documented or recorded so that's what he was doing it kind of um and you know at the beginning of his career and just Studying. It's interesting because, um, you know, to see how political his, to see how political academia can become. I mean, he's another one of these people that um, is really into studying, but just became a lot more outgoing out of, out of necessity. And his, um, he was a great leader, but then be, um, there was Booker Booker T. Washington, you know, we, you hear about Booker T. Washington in school stuff, or, you know, I did when I, when I, when I was a kid, but, um, he, um, started the Tuskegee in, Institution, which was a trade school, and so, this, so, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington had real disagreements about civil rights and like really Booker T. Washington he kind of just seemed like more of a he was just much more accommodating he was much more like of like okay we're, we'll do we'll do this we'll, he didn't see he didn't look at society at um, society being racist he didn't. He just looked at people. Oh, and so, yeah. and so, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a very. Um, okay. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> so, 
<clears throat> he was the, <clears throat> and so that's when, how, so with W.E.B. Dubois, I mean, he was one of the people who was really putting together um, racism and class and classism and how America about how racism was woke was just part of American society and people oppressing each other and oppression was how people were making money off of oppression and all that. I mean, stuff that, so it wasn't just people making change. You need to change systems also. Right. So my mind has just been really spinning around with um, Professor Dubois. I mean, and he did a lot of writing. And one of the things he was really interested in giving much more credit, much more credit or like really giving more headlight and, impor and importance to African American musicians and poets and writers and people really expressing themselves creatively and what and what that meant. So just very I mean everything was just a very big big picture with him and you know he kind of like he wasn't necessary um I don't know I mean the it's kind of hard it was hard for me to understand or I'm not quite he just had real sort of different ideas about segregation and desegregation than we might now or or um you know like in the early 20th century I mean the issue what people were um going like okay well we what if we just don't have anything to anything to do with each other right right basically but you know then people won't be able to discriminate but then you can't do that in a racist in a you know a racist society is still going to keep it's still going to oppress oppress people whether say so you need to try and change and change systems and that um and <clears throat> so like the and that was the issue with late with later on with Brown v, v board board of education because they had they had been trying to get across that separate but equal is equal. And so the legal case of Brown v. Board of Education is that separate but equal is not equal because you're excluding people. Your People are still being excluded from society. So, and you're, they're being um, segregated from chances and from opportunities to participate in society. Right. So... Yeah, so W. E. B. Du Bois um, w was one of the founders of the NAACP. So, and we talked about this a little bit, but just a big thing the NAACP was doing was going and do and documenting and try and um, publi and publishing newsletters and just really like letting people know what was go what was going on. And right. covering um, lynchings and yeah, just so yeah, it was pre it was pretty fascinating. And at the beginning of the NAACP, W. E. B. Du Bois was the only white, no, he was the only black board member. The rest of them were white, so mm. that was an issue that people were really dealing with with the NAACP because there was definitely I mean some that was I don't know because there were different people involved with like there were well-meaning people I mean but that were still racist or that were still like patronizing and paternalistic or people that like meant well but so I mean there was just a whole lot of different dynamics and as time went on that 
changed, but it was definitely always been an issue that people had with the NAACP is that there was too many white people in it. Right. So, yeah. So that, like, as time went on, I mean, because in the because in the or in the early years, I mean, there were just as um, you know, as more black people started, um, you know, getting as schools and all that, as more people started getting more skills and more recognition, right. more of that could change with the NAACP. But he was a pretty fascinating man. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very prolific. Oh my God. How do people? God, he wrote so much. So that's kind of what I've been um, thinking about a lot lately. The NAACP and and Pan Africanism. Just the efforts. But the the I just had never realized before how global the NAACP is. I thought that it was um, more just American, but just um, the, the NAACP was really involved with global, with global issues. So <clears throat> that was interesting. So I've been, um, because there was always a, you know, sort of like tactical concerns with, people, there were people that felt that um, they could further the cause of African Americans by um, working with people, by working in Pan-Africanism, by working with oppressed people around the world. And so there were people that felt that way, but then there were people that just felt like, no, the rest of the world will, will bring us down we need to be working on the U.S. in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. Deep. Yeah, 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 really deep. You know, I mean, just, why do we need to, just everything. I mean, there's just, there's just so many, so many layers. I mean, it's, all of this was just so complicated, so complicated, so much more complicated than, well, like anything, than you think, than you think at first. So, hey, Tony. So, <clears throat> That's okay. So that's um, Mr. Dubois. He was just a real god. He was a real character. And like, oh man, Booker T. Washington was a man. He was a pretty vengeful fellow. You know, <laughs> he, he really put himself before the movement. I think he really like kept people down in order to keep his own pat in order to keep himself more powerful and. Yeah, yeah, he was interesting. I mean, Dubois was a real complex char character, too. Yeah. yeah. So. Nice, nice. <sighs> okay, so we got about 15 minutes more to go. We don't need, to, yeah, so that's not really, not, not really enough, enough time to take a break. But, okay, so that's one of the, one of the books I've been reading, and we're, okay, so we're following, you know, we continue to follow Ethiopia and Abai Ahmed, their, um, their prime minister, who has pardoned all the dissidents. Um, there's, um, some problems, there's some, um, okay, some of them were, the dissidents that were pardoned were Tigrinya rebels, and the Tigrinya rebels, Tigrinya is what Eritrean people speak. So, you know, so we know there's been all these problems between, so some of these dissidents were Tigrinyan, were Eritrean na nationalists. So, um, you know, they're kind of keep, keeping an eye on that. And then <clears throat> a bunch so, you know, then we also follow um, Liberia with George, with George Way, the football, the footballer, the footballer president. Mm -hmm. um, and they just had, they're having a problem with like a bunch of money disappearing. And so Mr. Way is <laughs> right from the government. So we'll see where, where Mr. Way gets with, gets with all that. So... Yeah. Okay, 
so we are, so we're moving along with that. Oh man, okay, there was <clears throat> something, something about that. Oh, okay, so then, um, and then in Yemen, okay, we've been talking about how Yemen is just an absolute disaster, you know, as we know, it's a human rights and humanity and humanitarian disaster and so one of the things that's hopefully gonna that hopefully gonna help is that the United Nations is securing a port so um, it's supposed so that is supposed to um, it's supposed to guarantee safe safe passage this port you know guy keeps God, it's so beautiful. It's just amazing because it's such a, it's so beautiful. They show this place that's under siege, and thank God, the water is just so blue. It just makes me want to go there and go nice. swimming. Nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, in some of these places, it's like, it's, you know, like, oh, man. Because they used to be tourist de tourist de destinations. Libya was a tourist de destination. And so... I don't know. We just need to try and I don't know what's what's gonna happen with all that. So anyway, oh okay, and so then we earlier we were talking about um our okay, so article so here's more about the EU sanctioning um sanctioning Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, and it's um so it was written in a report that Hungary had breached various EU values citing migrant abuse, restrictions on press freedom, corruption and conflicts of interest, as well as stereotypical attitudes toward women. I'm like, wow, it wow, that's like a thanks EU. That's kind of nice that they, <laughs> that they that they care about that. But um, so it's called and it's called the nuclear article seven is called the nuclear option. Okay, and so that's what the that's what the sanctions on Hungary would be, and so Viktor Orban is accusing the European leaders of lawmakers of blackmail, and told the Hungarian parliamentarians that the country will appeal. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see what hap we'll see what happens with him. But I mean, basically, it's the it doesn't. You know, we just we need to. All of us. I mean, we need to try and deal with the deal with the right wing because they're not going. They're not going anywhere. You know. I mean, there's like the we were talking about the right wing movements in Sweden, and we have all of this in Hungary. We have the little prick that's from Austria. <laughs> Austria. Yeah. I like. Mean, I don't like this guy, man. Like, ew. Yeah. The mo yeah, yeah. Millennial, millennial fascist dictator. Just what we fucking need. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that guy. But anyway, okay. So back to Bobby Wine, um, who's a. I was. It was interesting because I was. So I was reading about um, Uganda has a real problem with hom with homophobia. Um, it's very dangerous to be gay there. Um, people been threatened. At one point, it was people been like threatened with the death penalty for being gay and so it's a it's a big problem and so um i found out that bobby wine see this is good here i was like liking this guy a whole lot and i still like him but um bobby wine was denied a visa to visit the uk in 2014 after gay rights campaigners accused him of inciting homophobic attacks in his song lyrics oh, wow. and what he said okay now and this is, I, he, what he said was, I am personally not out to threaten the life of any individual based on their sexual orientation. I just do not agree with them. This is my opinion and happens to be that of 99% of Ugandans. Okay, so this is, I have a real problem with the statement. I am not personally out to threaten the life of any individual based on their sexual orientation. That's sneaky. Because if you're a government leader, it's not enough to, if you're a leader, it's not enough to, like, say that you're not personally threatening people. I want to know if, what you're going to do about other people threatening. Okay, so, um, 
that's yeah that that's that's a problem and that's um you know so that made that made me a little nervous because that made it but um yeah because i mean that would that would just be a matter of concern but you know i mean the fact is the entire the you know the entire big picture of what's going on in uganda is a bigger issue right now. It's a real problem with it's a problem with me because you know, I mean, I'm gay, but I see like I have friends that really or people I know that are just that's all they know about Uganda and you know, you you just got to look at the, the look at the whole picture, you know. And right. okay, I'm like looking at, you know, I'm like looking at what at what's happened, what's happening with Bobby Wine and I don't like what he, I don't I'm not wild about what he said about I'm gays, but I'm a lot less, you know, I am more not wild about how he is being treated by his country. So that's Bobby Wine, and I really hope he's doing, he looks a lot better than he, you know, than he did. And I've seen some interviews with him, so, you know, but that's great. Oh, oh but, and so, because then what he's saying in the, in you you listen to him being interviewed and a whole lot of other dissidents have been were picked up also okay it's not just him I and mean, he's real clear about that so you know not looking good over, not looking good over there oh boy yes yes oh so i saw the mr rogers documentary Ah, you've seen it. How oh, was finally. it? Oh, it was so good. I mean, since I've watched all the episodes as an adult and read a lot about him, I mean, it wasn't. It's not like it was so new to, new to me. But um, love Mr. Rogers, and so the big quest. Some of um, so um, they interviewed some people. So what you, I found out, some of the people from the show were saying that, like, actually, Mr. Mr. Rogers could crack a few dirty jokes. So, <laughs> they said some. They were interviewing people from the show, and they're saying, "Yeah, we had a lot of fun. We're never gonna say what it was." And they're like, "Won't you say one thing?" They're like, "No." And they said that, you know, and but the question everybody always wants to know about Mister Rogers is, was he really like that? And all the people that knew him said yes. No, he was. Oh, what? Yes, he really was that oh, nice. Oh, well, I know the nice part, but I mean, like, no, he was really like that. Oh wow. Yeah. Ooh, that would be weird, though. Why? My dad uh, met my dad met him when he came. Well, I'm, I met him in. Um, my dad met him when he came because my dad's a pediatrician, and Mr. Rogers came to um, visit visit kids. And Dad said he was just amazing with all of them. That was the time when I met him too. Um, but that was good, you know. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> okay. Oh, this is so bad. Okay, this is. Um, I've been watching Bert and Ernie on YouTube. Oh, wow. <laughs> because, okay, there's this whole, because, okay, you know, there's always been this talk about whether Bert and Ernie are gay. And so one of the writers for the show just gave an interview saying that, Okay, because I mean, because a lot of people have done the writing since Burton Bert and Ernie have been around since 1969, and so a guy who wrote for them for a long time was just interviewed and said that, like, yes, he did, he was gay, and he kind of modeled Burton Ernie on himself and his partner. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I started. It's a sort of, you know, just. So I've been watching Burton and Ern Bert and Ernie this week and just cracking up. I love YouTube. It's so funny. But yeah, so but I was like particularly reading that article this week sort of reminded me and I'm like, God, I love YouTube. Hey, hey Bert. <laughs> <I know. laughs> right. the one, there's one where he's like, I'm so thirsty. Like trying to get both, you know, where Ernie gets Bert to bring him a glass of water when he's sleeping. I could totally see how and like apparently like their their friends would call them Bert and Ernie. <laughs> so yes so that is my excitement, my excitement for the week nice and we're going to be back really soon yes we are Tuesday night Tuesday night at Anna's Historical Book Club yeah because last Tuesday I was at an opera and then 
this past Tuesday, we decided it turned out to be Thursday, so, like, yeah, it was a really good... Right, so check in next Tuesday. We look, yeah, check in next Tuesday, everybody. And it's Historical Book Club, Yeah, y'all. and thank you, Tony, and thank you, Maurice, for watching. Right on, Tony and Maurice. Big appreciation to you. Much love. Okay. All right. All right, good night. Good night, everybody. See you next time.